Welcome back into another episode of the Scoop Rewind podcast brought to you by PPG. I'm Josh Getzoff, usual cast of characters with me. We have Michelle Crecciolo and Sam Cassant from Penn's Inside Scoop, Paul Staggerwald, longtime Penguins voice, member of the organization Fabric of the Black and Gold, joining us here as well on the podcast. Well, guys, the last time we talked, uh, the Penguins even the series at two games apiece. They held serve on home ice, which they did not do in 2008, and everyone was feeling pretty good. Going into game five, as things went back to Motown, the Red Wings looked tired, the Penguins looked energized. So what happened in game five? <laughs> well, speaking of getting energized, I think, you know, Pavel Datsuk returned for game five after missing the last eight games due to injury. He hurt his foot in game two of the Western Conference Finals. So I think that was a huge, much needed boost for the Red Wings, who had been looking fatigued and, uh, you know, seemed like they're, old legs were <laughs> catching up to him. So, you know, to get a Hart Trophy finalist, the Selkie Trophy, uh, Lady Bing Memorial Trophy winner back in the lineup, I think was huge. I mean, before the game, he said he felt like he was 18 years old. Uh, and I, I think, you know, when the game started, he was welcomed back with chance of his name. And, you know, he responded by setting up Dan Cleary's opening goal after laying a huge hit on Evgeny Malkin. So I think, you know, that was a huge catalyst in getting uh, the Red Wings the victory that day. I think that it was, uh, you know, one of those situations where the Penguins had won game six and it was so an, such an emotional win. Uh, and this was uh, the Red Wings sort of bouncing back, you know, like realizing that they were, you know, in a, a situation where they uh, had an opportunity to, uh, to win. And they just, for some reason, that the, the Red Wings, to me, were a team that, uh, seemed to lose its mojo. But then all of a sudden, all I could think of was during that game five was the Penguins cannot beat Detroit in Detroit, you know? And that was the thing that really worried me is that as good as the Penguins looked on home ice and they won game six and they, they just looked fabulous, they still uh, were unfortunately not the same looking team, I thought, on the road and in this game in particular. I was a diesel. Brian Trotchy at a watch party. What a reference. <laughs> and it was fun. I mean, there was a big screen and, you know, it was well organized. I, one of the radio stations participated and it was Trots and me, through, you know, like, uh, so when the game was being played, we didn't do anything. And then in the, in the intermissions, we got up and talked and stuff. And I can just remember when the game was over, uh, you know, getting up in front of the fans and going, it's not over yet, you know. Uh, you know, Penguins have another chance to come back and win game six. Don't worry, you know. And, uh, you know, it's been done before, you know, Trotz, he's really positive. So he was like really positive and we're going, let's go Pens and everything. But it was hard to get the crowd really excited at that point, I, you know, because people just, I think, felt like the Penguins, uh, for some reason, just could not get over the hump with this, this Red Wing team, as good as they looked on home ice against them. Uh, when you lose five, nothing. Makes you feel like, man, these guys are really tough to beat. I think just things really unraveled for them, particularly this second period. I mean, it was only one nothing after the first period, and it was still a tight game. But the Penguins in that second period, Sergey Gonchar takes a penalty, Malkin takes a penalty, Kunitz takes a penalty, Crosby takes a penalty, Talbot takes a penalty, Malkin another penalty. Like it was just penalty after penalty after penalty, and they were putting their PK in just a bad situation. And the sad thing is, the PK had done such a great job the opening four games that you're just asking the you ask them to kill six penalties in a single period I and mean, that's asking too much against that red wings power play especially when they got have out that suit back so i think the penguins kind of were very undisciplined in that second period they got called on a lot maybe they were getting away with some things in uh games three and four that were called a lot more tightly in that fifth game the, the referees weren't giving you know kunis as much leeway as they did in that second period and they called him for their roughing penalty but or evgeny malkin for the elbowing penalty and so they, they were kind of calling the Penguins of some of the things they were doing. As a result, the PK was out there a lot, and the Red Wings finally just put up three goals on them. And then at the same time, you know, we talk about the goaltending, the mentality, and how good Marc-Andre Fleur was at home, as opposed to sometimes when he was on the road. And, and really it came down to Marc-Andre Fleur had a little bit of a meltdown in that, uh, in that second period. And I actually remember when he got pulled, because he got pulled late after he gave up the fifth goal. There was still like three minutes left in the second period. He went in, broke his stick, and took all the other sticks he had on the rack and literally went down and just broke them all. That's how angry and just like, yeah, that's how that's how frustrated and upset he was. So the funny thing is, if he had to go back in the game, I don't think he had a stick. So <laughs> then, then he sat on the bench and he, he and he's just beside himself because 
I mean, I, I, you, you got to think he's thinking there like this is our great opportunity to kind of take this series by the by the throat. And instead, like they probably put on their worst performance, maybe the entire playoffs, honestly, not just in the final, but their worst performance that entire 2009 playoff run. So uh, he was obviously very frustrated and upset by it. And, you know, and it was just the bottom fell out. Literally anything that could have go, go wrong did go wrong for the Penguins. It's funny you say that, Sam, because when I was watching the game, I was taking notes and I actually wrote down how much of a beating did the walls at Julio Serena take with Flurry's stick? And I guess I should have amended that to say sticks because you knew he wasn't happy. But also, too, I mean, going into that game, you know, Detroit had the best regular season power play, but they had struggled a lot going into this game. They were one for 10, I think, on the man advantage. So for them to get it going like that with three goals on the power play, I think was huge for their confidence. It just felt like everything that could go wrong did go wrong for the Penguins, and it was the opposite. Uh, for the Red Wings. And I mean, especially too, like you said, Staggy, Joe Louis I remember just, you know, turning the game on and just being like, man, Joe Louis was thunderous. I mean, the fans were just feeling it and the wings were definitely feeding off that. So, uh, and it was funny too, Sam, you said it was interesting how when the Red Wings won, every win was so dominant, you know, and a lot of times the Penguins almost had, they were a lot closer and tighter played. So uh, that was, you know, the definition of a dominant win. And they were feeling good about themselves going back to uh, Pittsburgh and, I don't think the Penguins necessarily uh, <laughs> felt uh, felt that great about themselves going back. I think you just said something that's pretty interesting as it encapsulated that game five, Michelle, with the Red Wings having gone one for 10 on the power play the first four games. They got nine power plays in game five. So the Penguins almost equaled the amount of power plays they allowed the Red Wings to have in one game in and of itself. I wanted to share this line. I don't know if you guys saw this. I was reading through some stuff about game five after the game, and Mike Babcock was asked about – how things had gone in Pittsburgh and then how things had swung, obviously, with the series coming back to Detroit and the Penguins or the uh, Red Wings winning five, nothing in game five. And he said, quote, it's amazing how tired you look when you're not scoring. And they are. And I just <laughs> thought that was such a simple quote. But wasn't it true when you watch that game, like the Red Wings look bigger, they look faster in game five. And in game four, we were talking about it in our last podcast, the Penguins looked hungrier, they looked quicker, they were faster to pucks. Like, it's so interesting how that little quote makes so much sense in the sense of a game, uh, a Stanley Cup final, especially, too. Yeah, and momentum's a weird thing in hockey. I mean, when th when it's going your way, it's like you're going downhill, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and when, when it's not, it's like you're trudging up a steep mountain, you know, so I think... You know, the Penguins looked like they were going downhill, and, and you know, in game four, I thought, you know, and, and in game five, uh, everything turned around again. And so it's like, I don't know. I, I, I didn't, I remember, I think I, Dexter, what's it up? I remember. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's time. For, yeah, we had Maxi and uh, Louie join the podcast. It was Dexter's. <laughs> <turn>. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. <laughs> so anyway, I, I wanted to say this, though. I, I think, uh, I, I remember. I texted Mario uh, after game five. I was mad because all those penalties in the second period and everything. And I think I might've been mad at the referees or something. And, and uh, Mario said, easy, Staggy, have a glass of wine. We're going to win or something like that. It was like, that's great. So, you know, he, was like, because I, he was like the calming, you know, guy, because after game five, he actually did text uh, the coaches uh and he said we are a family and we're in this together we will win tuesday and win the cup on friday that is amazing i mean he was just absolutely confident in this team and, and what they were going to accomplish he never wavered in, on that and i think uh, that was inspirational to the team as we'll talk about later but there isn't any question that uh, uh that first text that he sent of course we know about a famous text he would send later but that first one was pretty significant also because he was he basically said don't worry about it we're going to win both games and forget about game five it's over and let's let's move on yes thank you. i'm glad you brought that up because i actually wrote a story about not only that text but the other text and uh after game five mario did go into the locker room and purposefully he wanted to go in and show that he wasn't you know wavered that he was that he still had the confidence in this team he had he still had his normal charisma you know the, the regality of him uh, just waltzing in, full of confidence, full of swagger, even though the, the guys were kind of down. And what spurred that text that Staggy just said was um, Ray Shiro actually texted Mario and thanked him for going in the room and said not a lot of people would do that. You know, we really appreciate you being there and showing your support. And that's when Mario responded with that text, we are family and in this together. Um, we don't need anyone that is only with us winter tie. 
I really think this is our year. Let's forget about tonight. It happens. We'll win, the, we'll win Tuesday and win the Cup Friday. So it was the precursor. And then Ray Shiro shared that with the coaching staff, that message from Mario. But I think him going into the room after such a tough loss, too. And another guy that stepped up, I think, after that loss was Billy Guerin. Who, uh, obviously, the guys were down and everyone was kind of sulking their heads. But I remember he purposely went to the PR staff and said, I want to speak to, with the media. And so, of course, you know, we'll go wherever the herd wants to go. So we went over to Billy Guerin and all circled around him. And he kind of gave kind of a little, I don't want to say a pep talk, but kind of the same thing. Like, yeah, this is a bad game, but it's only one game. The series isn't over. We show that we can beat these guys or we believe that we can beat them again. So when you think about getting Billy Guerin and um, the veteran leadership that he had, I think he knew that that was a big moment for, uh, for him, for the team. And, and that was his time to really show that veteran leadership. And um, he was he was obviously trying to rally the troops, trying to rally his team. And, uh, and he, he really stepped up in that. So I think Mario sent a message, you know, Billy G sent a message, and, and the whole team kind of coalesced around those messages. You know, what's interesting, guys, is that, you know, for much of the playoffs that I've been through in my career with the Penguins and seeing them in situations where they were down, but they were able to come back and win, uh, none of us really should have been all that worried about it in terms of, the ultimate outcome of the series because we knew that there was still a game six and it wasn't over yet. You got to win four to win the, to win the series and win the, the cup. So, you know, all of those things are at play. Except that, as I said earlier, when you're in Detroit, you just you don't feel like you're going to get it. It's just I can't explain it, but it was just there was something about that team, that building, and and up, up to that point. Um, I, I was reading a, a column that Joe Starkey had written last year on the anniversary anniversary of the uh, of the win of 10 years. And uh, he made the point that he thought it was a very, like a, a, almost a miraculous kind of a thing that for the Penguins to be able to win the cup because they uh, had had to win four out of five after losing the first two. So that that's what was daunting about it from the start is that you're down 2-0 and you, and you haven't, they had, they had won six of the last eight against Pittsburgh and Penguins did win one game in Detroit, but for the most part, it just looked like it was almost impossible to beat them there. So, uh, and, and I, that was the only thing that, that kind of made me feel badly is that they didn't play better in Detroit in game five than, but in the end, it, it, it really had no greater impact on the outcome because the Penguins were able to come home and play where they hadn't lost a game in like two months on home ice. Also too, and I know all of us watched the 09 uh, cup video, I thought it was interesting too. Is like once they got back and uh, you know started thinking about it and having that leadership from Lemieux and Garen and, and Josh, you probably uh, remember watching this just now. But but the guy said it almost was better that they lost by such a big margin because it was easier to you know just say you know what that was a an anomaly, a blip on the radar. You know we'll just forget about that one and put it away. Versus whether you lose like a two to one heartbreaker that uh, they almost approached it that way. And I thought that was really interesting that it almost helped the guys. Put it behind them after the fact versus if they had lost a closer game. Sam was there too. I think we've seen some of the video of them in that stretch. I think you know you got to remember, as, as Staggy pointed out in one of our other episodes, there was no gap between games one and two of the Stanley Cup Final. It was a little different in this situation. The Red Wings win Game Five, then it's a three-day gap between games five and six. So all of a sudden, everyone who was saying the Red Wings are tired, they're looking slow. Now the narrative becomes, as we know very well with these extended gaps in the Stanley Cup playoffs, well, maybe they'll get their legs back. Now they have a chance to win the Stanley Cup. They'll be the hungrier team come the next game in game six. But, Sam, I remember seeing these videos of Billy Garen in practice where he's mic'd up and messing with guys. And you pointed to the fact that he, uh, he kind of took a leadership role upon himself after game five. And that was with the media. But within his own dressing room, that was pretty obvious, too, to see what he was doing to kind of help the morale of that team and, and let them understand that there's still a massive opportunity in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes to the leadership and, and him, him knowing the situation, like him knowing that after you lose that tough one, you now your your backs are against the wall to use all the cliches, you know, on the brink of elimination, such and such. But, uh, you know, the fear there is that any mistake – and this thing's over. Like you, you make one mistake in a game, in a game six, and Detroit gets on you and beat you, then it's all over. And I, I think there was some tension there, and, and he knew that, and he sensed that, and that's why he was kind of making those jokes. You guys probably saw the videos of him in practice, um, just playing around with some of the guys, you know, jabbing Sid a little bit, you know, trying to get trying to get the guys a little loose because he know, knew that if you played tense hockey, 
things aren't going to go your way. Like the Penguins, especially their style, they need to be loose. They need to be fast. They need to be reactive. They couldn't be overthinking. They couldn't be, you know, tightening their grips. They had to be loose. And so I think he sensed that they were a little bit tight, and a little bit tense after that loss. And so he went out in those practices, the subsequent practices, and really tried to push the personality that he has that only Billy Guerin has uh, and get out of them the, the laughter and the smiles and, and try to ease the tension, if you will, because he knew that was going to be a big factor in game six. He still had some uh, some uh, jump in his legs too, Billy Guerin. It wasn't like he's just this old guy that you know couldn't you know was on his way out. You know he could still he could still play the game at that age, and uh, I think that becomes evident in Game Six. He he, he skated well in Game Six and you know, kind of led the way and with uh, in terms of being able to play. He actually looked younger, I thought, in that game. I was I was amazed. There's one rush where he came down the right wing and he kind of stepped to his right, shot the puck and. It looked like old Billy Guerin because he used to score a lot of goals coming down the wing and on slap shots. That was kind of his specialty. And uh, just great to see him be able to kind of go out there and, and walk the walk after talking the talk like that, you know. You talked a lot about the numbers game within the series. And you guys mentioned, you know, you're reading into uh, between the tea leaves, I guess you could say, after games one and two. And X number of teams that win games one and two win the series X percent of the time. Well, I thought this was interesting. I saw this, that at the time of Detroit winning game five, 14 of the previous 19 series in the Stanley Cup final where the team had won game five went on to win the cup. So, Staggy, you mentioned a little bit earlier about Joe Starkey's column and how difficult it was to win game seven. It's hard to win game six, too, when you think about it just based on the grand scheme of things. And that's what we'll jump ahead to now. Let's let's first go into game six. I want to start with Michelle, actually, though, uh, because <laughs> We've been all through the roller coaster of this series, Michelle, and you obviously were a part of Red Wing Nation. You were there when they won the Stanley Cup the year before. Now you're one win away again. We all just talked about what happened in game number five. You had to be feeling pretty good as this series went back to Pittsburgh, almost deja vu in a way with the cup in the building. Oh, my goodness. It could not be more deja vu. And, you know, I think there were times in the series, and I've talked about this in previous episodes that we record recorded, that you know, you almost sense that this might not be the Red Wings year. And I think, you know, after uh, the Penguins won two games at home, that feeling was more prevalent than ever. But with the way the Wings responded in game five to get everything going again, I, the confidence was definitely there. And it, this is a team that knew how to win. And the Penguins hadn't done that yet. So you had that faith that they were going to be able to get the job done, even going into a building that had been tough for them uh, to play in. And I think, honestly, like looking back on all this, getting Datsuk back was such a big boost for the the team, for the fans, for everyone. And, you know, he started game six off real hot as well and, and made an incredible play, I think, just a few minutes in. And so you're feeling good. So I think, you know, just knowing the, you know, having so many players on the team that had won before uh, definitely gave you confidence and uh, <laughs> would turn out to be short-lived. But uh, I think I think we were definitely feeling good there in game six. What about Sam and Staggy? Where were you guys at? Um, I had, you know, seen the Penguins uh, come from behind before and win cups. Uh, so I wasn't, uh, you know, all that uh, uh, concerned about game six. Uh, I hate to keep harping on it, but I was also thinking, okay, we still have to go back to Detroit and win a game seven. But, you know, I'm, I, I think we were very, feeling very confident about uh, what we could do in game six. Um, the Penguins have been phenomenal, really, on their home ice uh, throughout the playoffs. And so why would we not feel confident? I mean... And I, I think the, you know, maybe those few days off actually were good because it gave the Penguins kind of a time to really kind of reset, re-energize, and, and uh, the city to get all pumped up for the game. And the atmosphere was spectacular at the Civic Arena. And uh, so I, th I think we're, so I'm sure Sam will share this because he thought the Penguins were going to win the series all along. Uh, you know, we were confident. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I have to... I was like game five gave me a little pause. <laughs> but I, I did still believe that the, the Penguins were going to win the series. Um, the, the only thing, and the other thing that I guess gave me pause is that, like I said, I think the team obviously had a meltdown in game five. Narco Andre Fleury also had a meltdown in game five. And you can be the better team, but if the goaltender doesn't play the way he needs to play, you're going to lose a series. So uh, I, I felt as long as Mark andre Fleury could bounce back and hold his own, the Penguins were going to win the series. He was kind of the X factor, I guess, if you will. So going into game six, uh, my own mentality was on Mark andre Fleury. How is he going to respond 
to this. And, and I think Michelle made a good point too. I think getting blown out, if you will, was almost better for him than getting pulled because I think it gave him a little extra bite in, uh, in his game. So uh, I think it was good for him because if, lo- if you lose 2-1, you know, who, who knows how you kind of respond. So it was almost nice to get the one meltdown out of the way. You, you wouldn't expect him to do it twice in this series, but that was certainly the uh, certainly it's in the back of your mind. And, and Staggy's right too, going thinking going back to a game seven because in my mind I thought the Penguins are going to win four straight and win it at home in game six. It certainly changes the landscape when you have to go. I know we're getting ahead again of ourselves, but have to go to Detroit for game seven. But needless to say, I, I, certainly going into game six, I was confident the Penguins were going to force it to seven. So what did that save three minutes and 25 seconds in on Henrik Zetterberg do for you then as far as the confidence and Flurry's ability to bounce back? Oh, Josh, uh, you must be reading my recaps and my uh, what the watch for is on the website. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I thought that was the save of the game. Not I know we'll talk about the Cleary save and the breakaway and the Scuderi save and all that stuff, but really I think that was the biggest save of the moment because three minutes in, Datsuk sets, Hederberg, sets up Zetterberg all alone in the slot. And right away, Flurry's tested. So right there is kind of the make or break moment, I think, of the game, for particularly for Marc Andre Flurry and his psyche. Not only does he make the big save to keep the Penguins at zero zero to keep them in the game and not trailing three minutes into a game, but I think for his confidence, for his psyche, for his mentality, he needed that save to really set not only set the tone, but to get him feeling good and getting those good vibes going in, in uh, his game. So I, I think that was a huge part of the game. And you know, it's funny if you look back on it now, the, the Red Wings only had three shots. In the first period, but two of them were Zetterberg point blank. So, <laughs> I mean, they didn't get a lot of quantity, but man, they had some, all three of their shots were quality. So I think that save set the tone for Marc Andre Fleury. And I think that's actually, Josh, you talked about that. I said going in, that was the big question mark for me was how Fleury would respond. When he made that save, I kind of exhaled. I was like, all right, they got this. You know, it's funny how we always talk about first goals and how important they are. Well, how about early saves? I mean, you know, you make a key save early in a game on what could have been a first goal. And it, hey, and Oscar did the same thing in game five. The tone, the, I'm sorry, what, Josh? Oscar did the same thing in game five. Penguins started that game in a flurry. We probably yes. should have mentioned that, too. Yeah. He was big there to start. So, same thing yeah. with flurry. No pun intended. So, <laughs> you know, so, you never really know. Um, you know, uh, I, you know I, that maybe a big save in a situation like that is every bit as big as a big – as a goal, as a first goal. So, and certainly – well, I don't, who knows what the Red Wings would have done in that first period in terms of generating more offense if they had scored there because the Penguins would have been on their heels, I would bet, and uh, you know, maybe the Red Wings would have been able to build off of that. But uh, instead, the Red Wings just kind of lost their mojo in terms of their offense. They did have a few odd man breaks, but as Sam said, only three shots, and then one of them was another great, great save by Florian Zetterberg with about a minute and a half to go. But a lot of stuff happened in between, of course. Well, you gotta love on that play right after Flurry makes the save. Jordan Stahl pushes Ederberg right into Flurry, and he actually had to hang onto the crossbar so he didn't like slam it into it. And then he gets called for goalie interference, so the Penguins go to the power play. So I, uh, Eddie, you had thirteen here. power plays in Game Five. Get over. <laughs> Did you just you know what? That was a horrible show? call. <laughs> yeah, that Bill McCreary. Yeah. Bill McCreary made that call from the neutral zone. Yeah, like what you know, was it was a lot. It was a bad call. It was, you know, Penguins, was, Penguins definitely got a break there. No question about it. They got a break there and they got some momentum there because, I mean, uh, they had some incredible scoring chances on that power play. I think uh, Billy G, you know, we talked about how much of a factor he was in this game. I feel like there was one play in particular that started with some incredible puck possession by him where you could tell he was just feeling it. And really, you know, if the, yeah, if the Red Wings score there, uh, it's a different game, but not only do, does Fleury make that save, which is huge for his psyche and for the you know score in general, the Penguins get a power play, they build some momentum, and from there, you know, they they definitely, uh, I feel like, tilted the game in their favor. Well, I think Staggy talked about the Billy G opportunity, the Garen chance, and if you watch that play, it's about halfway through the first period. It comes off of a stretch pass where Chris Kunis has the puck in his own zone at the bottom of his own circle, hits Billy G on the opposite of the red line, and then Billy G, 38 years old, God bless him, has a full head of speed. And Brian Rafalski, who was standing, still has to turn around and try to catch up with him. You know, and, and that's where you see the Penguins were faster in that sense. And um, Staggy pointed out that Billy G was flying in that game. I think plays like that really demonstrated that ability of the Penguins. And he came down and snapped off that quick shot. And uh, Osgood, who probably had his best game of the, of the entire final, I thought he was phenomenal in game six. I mean, that's that's really was. Safe. He was great. No question. The more, you know, right up to the end, he was awesome. The Penguins could have won that game going away. 
he was really good. The shots were indicative of that. I mean, the Penguins were really getting good chances and uh, out shooting the Red Wings badly for a, for a long time in that game. Long stretches. And about halfway through, too, I think a couple, two, two plays really stood out to me that kind of spoke to the Penguins taking over the series. One was uh, City Crosby getting down and blocking a shot, which then led to a three-on-two rush for the Penguins. Pittsburgh had 20 block shots in that game, which was the most, I mean, they would have 20 in game seven as well. But uh, th- those two were the most they had the entire final. So it speaks to the desperation of the team, and especially when you've got your captain going down, blocking a shot. And then, of course, they created some offense with three on two. And then not even a minute later, Guinea Malkin just runs Rafalski with a huge hit. And when your two superstars are blocking shots and throwing hits, I mean, that, that speaks to the sacrifices that, that the team makes. And that really sets the tone, too. Everyone else is going to see that, and it's going to have this trickle-down effect when you see plays like that. And P- Peter Socorro was on that three on two rush. It was Kennedy, Sid, and Sakura. And uh, you know, he hadn't played the previous games in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was Shatan. So there's Sakura back in the lineup. And he's on that three on two. And I, once again, I, coaching staff, Dan Bilesman did a really good job of sprinkling guys around and moving people in and out of different positions on different lines. And, uh, you know, I, I know even back then, uh, Dan Bilesman liked pairs. Uh, like he liked, he liked Sid Kunitz. He liked that as a pair. He liked Sid Garen as a pair, uh, just as Mike Sullivan likes his pairs now. That's kind of when that trend began in the NHL, I think, where you weren't thinking too much of trios, but with duos and then another guy sprinkled in every now and then. They did a lot of that in this series, and I think really effectively. Uh, it just seems like he, Dan Biles had pushed a lot of the right buttons. And it was nice to see Socorro back in there after, you know, Sicky was a big guy in 08 when he got that overtime game winner, but he remained a, a, an important player on the team with a depth player for them. And the funny thing with that, too, is he started – the score went back in the lineup. He hadn't played since the Washington series, game two against wow. Washington. I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah, so, so he gets back in the lineup on the fourth line, and by the third period, they actually put him up with Malkin and Fedotenko. That was the second line. And they put Max Talbot down on the fourth line with Adams and um, – I forget who else at the moment uh, – Dupuy. And so they actually had Max Talbot was on the fourth line for game six. Amazing. And then they made the switch going into game seven to put Talbot back up on the second line. And of course, we know how that plays off. But uh, it's kind of funny to think about it, those minor tweaks. I mean, here's Max Talbot who ends up being the game seven hero. He's playing on the fourth line in game six. So it's crazy how they kind of bounce things around. But he was sprinkled around, too, because I have him uh, one time. Uh, for instance, at the end of the game, he's playing. I don't want to go too far ahead, but just to, I wrote down. He was with Cook and Stahl. So he, you know, once again, I mean, they were, Talbot was like the secret weapon that you could put him with anybody and he was going to make big plays. He was so good in his own end in this series. And Penguins did a good job with quick exits, I thought. You know, they, they didn't, the Red Wings, uh, one of the reasons they couldn't generate any offense is because they had no zone time. Penguins were very good at getting pucks out right away, lugging them and, you know, their forwards coming deep. Like Talbot, he, sometimes he's the first man on the puck, getting it behind his own net and carrying it out. Uh, things like that. So I, I was impressed with that. And Brooks Orpik is another guy who probably quietly, I, mean, I know the announcer said Eddie Olchek was raving about him. He got high praise throughout, but uh, they were saying it was his best game of the, of the playoffs. Yeah, we talked about the block shots. Orpik had six block shots in the game, which led both teams. I mean, it was a game high, six block shots. He was sacrificing the body. You guys talked about some of the magic that Dan Bilesma had with putting his lineup together. And earlier in one of our episodes, we talked about how he formed the line of Tyler Kennedy, Jordan Stahl, and Matt Cook. And we saw that line go to work early in the second period, just 51 seconds in, Jordan Stahl opening the scoring. First of all, we talked about the big saves early on, how important those are. Staggy, you kind of worked that in with the first goal aspect of the game as well. Penguins got both of those. They got the first big save from Marc-Andre Fleury, and then, of course, they get the big goal from Jordan Stahl, who probably picked uh, – he only had four goals in the playoffs at that point, but two of them were probably two of the biggest goals the Penguins had as a team in the entire postseason to that point. Yeah, and uh, I really like what he did on that play. It was a two-on-one. He decided to shoot the puck himself. Uh, when Dan Bilesman took over the team, he was really, really uh, adamant about guys shooting pucks off the pads. They called it P.O.P., pass off the pads. And, <laughs> and they didn't, you know, want to be forcing plays on two-on-ones all the time. And I still see the Penguins today doing it much in practice and stuff. They're trying to make a play across to a guy in a two-on-one. Just shoot it off the goalie's pads and let the other guy go get the rebound. Well, in this case, 
Stahl shot it. He didn't try to force that play across. And then he got his own rebound off the pads and put it in. So uh, it was an example, I think, of Stahl thinking that way because I, I, I noticed it uh, right from the minute uh, Chris Kunitz arrived in Pittsburgh. That was a game in Chicago. And Dan Biles had only been there a couple of weeks, and he was talking about pass off the pads, pass off the pads, north-south. And Stahl bought into that theory really fast. So to see him score a goal there, doing that very thing just reminded me of that. Uh, he kept it simple. You know, he didn't try. You know, Stahl wasn't a great playmaker. He didn't have great soft hands necessarily, you know, the way Gino and Sid do, you know, to take a saucer pass over there and execute a perfect two-on-one. So he just shot the puck, and he went to the net and got his own rebound. That's a great goal. And speaking off of what, actually what you said earlier, Staggy, about the team getting the puck out of their own zone, the play really starts. It was a, a loose puck on the wall, and Kennedy, uh, Lebda actually pinches in to try to keep it. And Kennedy chips it past him, and then Philpola reloads over into Lebda's old spot. I mean, a, a forward that's not used to being in a defensive posture. And Stahl actually banks it around him and goes up and retrieves his own puck. So it basically comes up two simple wall plays where they just bank the puck around these two Detroit players. And it results in that two on one. And as you said, saw from there, shot and then got his own rebound and uh, buried the goal. It really was a beautiful sequence. And two, Hal Gill had a good stick check at the net so that the Pens could actually get to the puck in the corner to make that the first wall play that led to the second wall play. So it's, you know, it's small plays, it's details. How many times do we hear Mike Sullivan talk about the details of uh, the team game? And that was definitely a situation where that was a perfect example of that. I don't want to go ahead, Stack. Are you going to say something? I'm just going to say Osgood made the save. You know, his job you know, on a two on one is to worry about the shooter. He hung in there and, you know, he, and a good first shot by Stahl, so good that Osgood had trouble handling the rebound and couldn't find the loose puck and, and Stahl pounced on it to get the goal. It was, man, that was big, too, because the Penguins had dominated the first period and had nothing to show for it, really. So to come out early in the second and get a goal right away was really big. NBC had a great angle. I know we can only cover so many things within our uh, the okayness of it being repeated on the air here. We get some leeway in this, but NBC had a great angle of Chris Osgood's mouth after that puck went past. I'm not going to repeat what he said, but if you look at it real quickly on YouTube, <laughs> you'll see that he was a little frustrated. The rebound got past him. I don't want to jump too far ahead in case you guys want to share anything immediately after that stall goal, but I, I had to make a note when I watched this of, the big hit that Matt Cook threw on Pavel Datsuk when that line was back out there with about 12 minutes left, not too far, I guess, what, eight minutes after Stahl opened the scoring for the Penguins. That line was back at it again with a couple more opportunities. And I just, you could feel the building's energy on that hit from Cook on Datsuk to just kind of say, you know, the series is not as far from over, basically, was the message that I got. He wrote about that. And this is the moment where the Penguins really took over this game, that entire shift. Actually, because it actually starts with Cook stealing the puck from Datsuk. You don't see Datsuk have the puck taken off him too often. So Matt Cook, a guy not known for his takeaways either, just picked the pocket of Datsuk to keep the puck in the offensive zone. Sets up stall for a chance right in the slot. And Osgood again, another good save. And then Datsuk goes and retrieves the rebound. And Cook comes all the way around, just hammers him into the boards, knocks his helmet off. And you're right, right, uh, Josh. The crowd just went absolutely crazy whenever that happened. They were. All, I, I don't think anybody was see, sitting after that huge crush by uh, Matt Cook, but you could just feel it then. And, and like I said, I think that's where the Penguins really started to assert themselves. How about that line, though? I mean, you had Cook banging in bodies, Stahl with that long reach, you know, and, and being able to, you know, basically with that range that he has, it's really hard to get around him. He's really good defensively, and he's, he's scoring big goals. And then I thought Tyler Kennedy was absolutely flying in game six. Like, there were a couple times where he took the puck and just took off with it. And – uh He's an underrated little player, man. I, you know, I, I don't know if people really give Tyler Kennedy even to this day enough credit. I, I think he was he was a really good player for the Penguins. And, uh, you know, early in the game, he had a chance where he came, he circled out to the right. The way You know how Brian Rush scores goals where he, he's a right shot, so he comes around the net, and then he shoots it back to the net from the left wing. And that That's how Tyler Kennedy scored his first NHL goal. And he had a really good chance on a play like that in this game. And then – of course, he would later on actually get a goal. It was very Brian Rust-like. Uh, but but I thought Kennedy, um, as much as we talk about that line and Jordan Stahl, and he was phenomenal in this game particularly. He really carrying the puck with confidence. PK had a uh, game-high six shots. There you go. So he was he was certainly made his presence known. That's amazing. That line was just perfect. We talked about it last 
podcast, but what a what a great combination they were. They were the perfect complement to one another. Amazing too. Me, me, so I've got a question for you. Yeah. Because uh, I was watching this, and particularly that shift, and just the way the Penguins were just out skating, out pacing, out running Detroit. And I was thinking, you know, the Penguins seem to have the younger team, the fresher legs, the younger guys. But Detroit had some young guys too. They had, you know, Cleary on the team at the time. Helm was younger than at the time, and Advocator. And then I realized Advocator wasn't playing. And then it dawned on me, and I went back and looked. He played the first three games. He scored in game one, scored in game two, played in game three. Then he was scratched the, the entire remaining part of the series. Do you – why? <laughs> do, you, do you remember why they decided to take him out of the lineup? I mean, here's a young guy, a fresh guy uh, who's got some speed, a lot of speed, Advocator. Do you, do you know why they ended up taking him out of the lineup? Because I, I don't recall from the Detroit side. I think it's a question that Red Wings fans are still asking themselves. Oh, oh. <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with the head coach. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually <laughs> i did uh find an article as i was just doing research uh and the headline is darren mccarty and mike babcock cost a trait red wings the stanley cup in 2009. <laughs> and, you know i think that you know obviously uh you know there's a lot of coaching decisions that work out and, and a lot of coaching decisions that don't but that's one that definitely was a head scratcher because you know it's just something where Abdulkader was such a factor in games one and games two, and I don't know what changed uh, at that point, but I've got to think it was because Babcock wanted that, you know, those veteran players that knew how to win, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, but, uh, you know, so Chris Draper was actually the one who came into the lineup for him, and so you get it, you know, he won in 97, 98, 0, 2, 0, 8. He's, he's done it before, he, he knows, you know, how to handle uh, the roller coaster of emotions that come with a game like this, but you know, with guys like Zetterberg, I mean, that's who did come back, but Zetterberg was so overtaxed still at this point. I mean, he had been carrying the load for so long and coming off, you know, with this being the second straight long run, uh, you, you would think that you would want to have a guy like Abdelkader in the lineup, even if he only played sparingly. Uh, so that's definitely a, a decision that I still uh, can't understand. And to, well, to Draper's credit, he did score in this game, which we'll talk about later. But I think, you know, the the Red Wings' old legs, they... You know, they they got some freshness in, in game five, but I think they started to get fatigued again, you know, going into game six and, you know, towards the end of game six and then game seven. So I think, you know, if, if Babcock could do it all over again or if, you know, Red Wings fans could do it all over again, Abdelkader would be in the lineup over Chris Japer because he had those those legs and, and that energy and that youthful enthusiasm that you need uh, to get the job done. Well, one thing that strikes me too when I think about the Red Wings is that they uh... – have always been an organization that really does not kind of push young players into situations until they know they're absolutely ready. And which I think sometimes with their, to, was the, to their detriment, I feel like they let guys die on the vine a little bit in the minors rather than just giving an opportunity to play. So it may have been some of that, just their philosophy that, that, they, that young players, uh, they make them really earn their spurs in Detroit. And maybe they just felt like, you know, he just wasn't ready to be given that that privilege of playing yet, you know, all the time, so, which is not necessarily the best way to go. Because sometimes young players, they just sometimes they play their best hockey in situations like that, you know, and then they come back the next year in the regular season and they go into a little bit of a dip and you find out that a lot of it was adrenaline and just being in that in that situation. And you'll never know because he never got another opportunity to show if he could do it. Well, he did later, in his career, obviously, but not in that series. Well, so I mentioned Zetterberg, and I, I wanted to ask you guys, are you scratching your heads as to how he didn't score in this game? Because, you know, he had that chance at the end of the first that uh, we talked about, um, or sorry, earlier in the game that we talked about. And then towards the end of uh, the second, I mean, with about two minutes left, I mean, he hit the post on an incredible, nicely played shot. I mean, the, the play itself was incredible. It started in the defensive zone. He had two penguins on him in the slot, but he's still able to muscle it up and out of the zone to Thomas Holmstrom. And then just Zetterberg just immediately joined the play, even though it was the end of a shift and got the puck back and cut across his body for a forehand shot that hit the post. This is at the end of a shift. You could really see the desire and the will to win from Zetterberg, but he didn't, he didn't, it, it didn't go in. And it's crazy to think, I mean, and we, we all know it takes a lot of luck to win a championship. I think that that right there is kind of like, oh, man, the hockey gods are smiling on the Penguins this year for sure. Yeah, he made the Forsberg move there where he uh, moved the puck under the tripod and then reached around and shot it. That was a great play. Um, 
I know. I mean, that just happens. Sometimes you're snake bit. And uh, Penguins were fortunate because he had two phenomenal scoring chances in the first, and then he had to hit the post late in the second. And uh, realistically, uh, he was the, he was their their offensive force, and he's the guy they counted on to score, and he and he, and he, did, he couldn't do it. But you got to give Flurry credit, and then of course hockey gods for uh, making sure that shot went off the post. Well, I think that was the moment where you knew the hockey gods were in the Penguins' favor because if you remember Game Six of 08, a similar situation where Flurry actually sat down and knocked the puck into his own net on his yeah. Edward shot. Yeah. <laughs> this time around, it's the same situation. Puck goes off the post, it's lying dead. And this time, Flurry does the same thing. He goes down. He goes down much flatter as opposed to backing up. He just comes down flat, lays his body down, and this time he's able to just cover it, which is probably what he should did in 08. But um, <laughs> so A, he learned his lesson and uh b you could see that you know the penguins didn't get the bounce in 08 they get it in 09 and and i think that was the moment where like all right the hockey gods are in their favor this is time it's, it's different this time it's it's destiny you guys i had to laugh too did you guys notice rob scuderi right behind flurry he like he was like he was nothing he was not gonna let that puck cross the goal line yeah, stick. yeah just like right behind flower yeah exactly josh was foreshadowing but i had to laugh because i think everybody in that moment was just it probably was slow motion like oh we know what happened last time we can't let it happen again and they definitely made sure it didn't and rob skitter was a big part of that and he was uh obviously a big part of what happens later in this game i thought doc emmerich had a great call on that play too sam you mentioned that it was kind of the same thing that happened in 2008 and i think he said something to the extent of the shot goes off the post at this time it stays out <laughs> he immediately was able to recall that moment from the year before, which I thought was kind of cool because I was thinking the same thing when I first watched it back. I was like, holy crap, this is like the exact almost the exact same sequence, <laughs> except the puck stays out. So that, that is kind of a cool way. And to your point about Zetterberg, Michelle, I don't know about you guys. Uh, I wish I would have appreciated him more when I was watching him live because he was I just come away to quote Phil Bork. Every time I see these things and these highlights and these replays and watching him and the plays he makes, I'm just like, holy H-E double hockey sticks. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember Bob Airy and I doing a preseason game on television uh, early in our time as uh, on TV. And we played a preseason game and Henrik Zetterberg was a, re a really young player. It might have been his first year or, you know, and it was a preseason game. So it was not, you know, a big game, like a playoff game, but. He was unbelievably dominant in the game. He was such a great two-way player. And I remember saying, this is the best 200-foot player in the game right now. Like, you know, and uh, I also remember some people taking me to task uh, for saying that on uh, one of the message boards after, you know, like, uh, you know, I was praising him too much for the Homer broadcaster to be praising the uh, opposition. But uh, I, I was just absolutely blown away by Henrik Zetterberg right from the start as a 200-foot player. And uh, you never know how good he's going to be offensively at that point, but you could see how good he was defensively right from the start. Yeah, it was uh, who's actually the obviously the GM of the Dallas Stars right now is the assistant GM with the Red Wings back then, and he's actually the one who, you know, saw him play for the first time. And it actually reminds me of what you know this Scott Bell, the scout who discovered Jake Gensel, uh, said about him is that you know he just always seemed to have the puck. He was a skinny little kid, but had incredible instincts and. You know, just the puck just seemed to follow him around the ice. And, you know, he obviously was a smaller guy, but, you know, made up for that, you know, lack of lack of size with his, you know, just instincts and, and skill and speed and all of that. But, you know, it's cool, too, because, you know, with Datsuk and Zetterberg, I mean, those guys were the biggest steals, I think, maybe of the all time in the draft in terms of, you know, Datsuk was taken uh, 171st overall in 98 and Zetterberg was taken 210th overall in 99. And for them to, you know, go on and have the careers they did is just amazing. But you know, I think too, something that people might not necessarily realize about Zetterberg is that he was playing with a, a back condition, much like Marilyn Lemieux, um, you know, which started around 2006 and eventually- really that later. early? Yeah. You know, I didn't know when it started, yeah. Yeah, he started getting the spasms back in 06. And so it was something that he was dealing with, maybe not as much obviously then, but something that, you know, dogged him throughout the rest of his career and forced him to retire just last year. So, you know, something where he's, you know, playing, at this incredible level while also, you know, dealing with uh, degenerative back conditions. So uh, definitely just such an incredible player. And I'm, I'm with you, Josh. It's just amazing to look back and, sh and see how truly dominant he was uh, back in those days. So how old was he, Michelle, in this series of uh, Zetterberg? 28. 28. Yeah. Still technically well, relatively, well, relatively young. Yeah. yeah. He's 
still had some good years left in him. Is what I'm, I, the reason I ask is because I'm thinking of now Sid, you know, and where he is in his career. Right. He's older than Zetterberg was at that time. Yeah, it's true. It's a very, uh, really interesting thing. I mean, I, there, there, one of the quotes from Brooks Orpik was he said in 08, the Red Wings were laughing at them. They're laughing at the Penguins. The Penguins were trying to hit them and trying to get them off their game. And they were basically, remember I told you Sid said they were creepy because they didn't really change their demeanor at all. But uh, Orpik said they were laughing at them. You look at the difference in 09, they weren't laughing anymore. Uh, they were, the Penguins had them on the run. Mark Eaton said, you know, after game six, he said, uh, you know, we said it's a marathon, not a sprint. He said, you could see things starting to turn when our forwards were starting to run through their defensemen and, you know, and that kind of thing. So they, they, they really had a, a strong sense of belief that they had the Red Wings where they wanted them in terms of uh, carrying the play and so on. And, how could you not think that after the first half of this hockey game? Because, I mean, the Red Wings had 18 shots at one point late in the game. And remember, they had 19 shots in the first period of game four. Right. They had only 18, like, with a half, half a period remaining in this game. So uh, they weren't shooting the puck enough, though. They were passing up opportunities to shoot throughout. And that's never a good thing because, you you know, they weren't really testing Mark Andre for it. And I wanted to, I wanted to say, too, Flurry faced only three shots in that first period, and two of them were point blankers by Zetterberg. And it's not easy for any goalie to be standing down there at the other end and not facing shots, and then all of a sudden have to make spectacular saves or be right on top of your game. So give him credit for that, because we all know Flurry tends to be a goalie who likes a lot of work. He likes a lot of shots. He seems to play better in those environments, but I think he kind of turned a corner in that regard in this series in the sense that he could still be sharp and make those big saves without seeing a lot of pucks. That one off the post and covered it up behind him after the Zetterberg opportunity. 36 seconds left in the period. Another thing that jumped out to me, we mentioned Chris Osgood. Did you guys, maybe it's just his equipment set up. And Sam, I know you were goalie staggy. I know you played between the pipes too. So maybe you guys appreciate this more. But when he makes those kick saves, I was thinking I'm watching a goalie from like the 70s with those brown pads that look like they're somehow attached to his leg just internally and not strapped on. He's swinging his legs out and making these. I just loved it. I mean, it was it was getting me excited watching it. But I mean, my point being, the Penguins never really had a problem weathering the waves within this game. I think they did a good job of anytime the wings had an opportunity, there was more coming back the other way. And uh, to that point, as I mentioned, 36 seconds left, you had Fedotenko and Malkin with great opportunities that Oscar was able to keep out. Yeah, great chances, really great. And that, you know, the first thing you think of, well, that's a goaltender keeping his team in the game, giving him a chance to win. Uh, the, if the Penguins get that next goal, I, I, I think it's a lot easier a night for them. But Osgood made sure he gave the Penguins, a, you know, forced them into having to really be at their best to win this game. And you're right. Osgood is interesting. He had that old school mask, too, you know, the helmet <laughs> and the cage, the old Dominic Hasek style mask. And those are, you know, that's, that's the kind of mask I wore in 1971 when I was playing South Park. Uh, you know, th those uh, those masks don't look like they protect you all that much. But uh, remember the one point he had to take it off and have it fixed uh, when Franzen crashed into the boards. And uh, he smartly sent his mask over to have it repaired. There probably was nothing wrong with it. He was trying to buy time uh, for Franzen. But, uh, yeah, he was definitely old school type goalie, Josh. I really liked the, his style. He wasn't really a butterfly goalie. He was kind of a hybrid in a way. And uh, he wasn't considered like the uh, an elite goalie in the league, except that he won, you know, and he won at the right time of the year. And so the Red Wings never spent a lot of money on their goalies. Uh, you know, they, their goalies were part of the team. They weren't like the guy on the team. And, uh, and yet he, he played as good as you can play in those pressure situations. Well, right, because Dominic Hoffman was the starter in 08, and then Osgood took over after the first two games of the playoffs. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of, you know, we talk a lot about the two goalie model with Pittsburgh, which obviously is, you know, given the Penguins a lot of success uh, recently. But yeah, the Red Wings were doing it uh, back in, you know, however many years ago, 10, 11 years ago, uh, just going with whoever was the hottest hand. So it's, it's interesting to see how so many parallels between these championship teams, like I mentioned in an earlier episode. Osgood's made or uh, retained a pretty high profile with the Red Wings organization. He's he's a TV broadcaster for them and uh, seems like a good guy, Michelle. Like, you know, a guy that I think players like. Seems like a good teammate. 
Yeah. The one thing that really stood out to me was uh, he was one of the better skating goaltenders too. His skating was really good, and and it had to be because he's he's only five foot ten, so he's a smaller goaltender. So in that case, he can't really be much of a butterfly because of his height uh, disadvantage, if you will, or maybe advantage. I don't know. Um, so he couldn't really be a true butterfly because he goes down, he leaves too much net over because he's only five ten. So because of that, he has to come out and challenge a lot. And you, you saw him a lot of those times. He was challenging was way above the crease because he had to because he was so short he had to really cut down angles when you come out and challenge like that if you're coming out to your right you're out here well if the puck goes to the other side you've got to be able to get over you got to cover a lot of ground and challenge like that and he was a phenomenal skater i think that that really stood out to me was his ability to get side to side and cover so much ground back up forth he was very mobile in, in that way and it probably his skating helped make up for maybe his lack of uh height I do think the fans there loved him because he was part of the 97, 98 rounds with Mike Vernon. And then, you know, to be part of 02 and, you know, 08 and 09, he was, he's seen a lot, you know, definitely in his Red Wings career. And, you know, we called him Ozzy. So <laughs> definitely a, a name, but you guys, I, I know that for me, I was, this third period was when I was really looking forward to watching. I mean, it's just, you know, considering what was on the line and I think, you know, neither team disappointed uh, in terms of just the intensity and, and the, you know, excitement of this final 20 minutes. How many times has Stag, you mentioned uh, Danny Cleary and Darren Helm during this series. They had some golden opportunities two and a half minutes in. I think it was what? Helm, Cleary, Helm. And Marc-Andre Fleury answered all three. You talk about the timely saves. It was the early first period stop on Zetterberg. Then with the Penguins up one nothing. If Detroit scores two and a half minutes into the third period, you got a very different feeling in that building and on the ice in that situation. So true. And that is such a big factor when you're facing elimination, too don't want to be in that position where the crowd starts to get that feeling of tension in the building that's the worst that's that's why that's when home ice is not an advantage when the other team snatches momentum and the crowd is quieted and you feel the nervous energy in the building it's horrible and i i think the penguins were victims of that earlier in their history uh in game sevens um you know and, and fortunately they they never really had to deal with that sort of tension in the building because of flurry Hey, making those big saves, uh, you know, when he made, did, like you said, early in the first and then again, early in the third. So he never gave the Red Wings that kind of life or took the crowd out of it, which could absolutely could have happened if they would have scored. And by the way, um, you know, think about that sequence, Josh. End of second, big saves by Osgood. Beginning of third, huge saves by Flurry. Just a great goaltending battle. You know, when you have a game that's low scoring like this, you know the goalies are playing a major role. Fair point. And it was Flurry that started things off in the third period, at least the goals uh, being prevented, that aspect. Then five and a half minutes in, let's talk about that huge goal from Tyler Kennedy. Uh, Sam, when you watch this happen, the first thing that jumped to me is you have both Jonathan Erickson and Nick Lidstrom going right to Max Talbot, which probably talks about the respect that he had gained based on his performance from the Red Wings, but also <laughs> they thinking, both drifting into the corner. And Max with a quick little play to get that puck to TK and give him credit for coming out with it. Yeah, I thought it was a bad read by Erickson there. And then on top of that, well, Samuelson's got the guy that actually he does pick up Kennedy. But then as Kennedy starts coming to the net, Samuelson, for whatever reason, backs off. He literally skates away and lets Tyler Kennedy come out from behind the net and get the shot off. I, I watched the replay a couple of times. I'm not sure what he's seeing, what he's thinking there. But uh, again, it was we talked about the Red Wings, how they were such a machine in 08. Well, in 09, they were doing a lot of leaky mistakes like that. And you can see it time and time again. I mean, how good was Brian Rafalski in 2008 and 2009? I feel like he was a turnstile. Every time the Penguins were using the defenseman, it seemed like it was him or Erickson or one of those guys that are normally pretty steady. Uh, a couple misreads there by the Detroit. And like, it's, like we said, Chris Osgood basically kept them in this game the entire time. But you can only make up for so many mistakes by your guys. Those guys were Penguins were good at getting the puck deep and working pucks behind the net. Really good at it. It's a dangerous way to, to play offense for the opposition. It's hard to defend. Uh, like you, that's when you get guys get confused. A D man leave the front of the net to go take a player below the goal line when he should have stayed at home. You have a forward thinking he's got to back out and protect the, you know some other area. And it just and, and that's the beauty of being able to work the puck down low to the success that the Penguins were able to do it. They definitely made that a big part of their strategy against the Detroit defense. Tyler Kennedy with his quickness um, came out again. Like I was saying earlier, coming out the other side, you know, he's a right shot coming out on the on the on the left wing side 
of the net to make that play and jams it in. What does that remind you of? I mean, how many times have you seen Brian Russ do that? Where he scores a goal from just stepping out like that, the side of the cage. It really wasn't a great shot. Like, I don't know if Osgood, what he would say about that goal today, he probably would say he should have had it. Like, because he really, he kind of left a lot of room there on the post. And I don't know if he played it all that well. But, you know, to TK's credit, he pounced quickly. You know, he jumped out there and made the play. And uh, he got a kind of got a bounce to have that puck go in behind Osgood. He might have surprised him. I don't think he was going to yeah. come that quickly. I think he was actually set, actually, for the shot. Yeah. yeah, maybe he was relying a little bit too much, as Sam mentioned, on Samuelson, just not reading the play and, and not being – seriously, like, that, that was – I mean, that's the first thing I saw. That one overhead they had, Samuelson is totally out to lunch when, when Kennedy's coming around behind the net there. So, team effort, I guess, in, in letting that goal go in. You know who Michael Samuelson uh, was traded for? Traded for? Penguins had him. He was a penguin. I know he's he traded. Perfect. He was traded to the Florida Panthers so that the Penguins could select Mark Andre Fleury. The Panthers took Jay Bomeister, and Craig Patrick took Mark Andre Fleury. So he had been a Penguin. He went to Florida in the deal that gave the Penguins the first pick in the draft, so they could take Mark Andre Fleury. So here he was back in Pittsburgh as a member of the Red Wings and a pretty good hockey player too, by the way. I liked him when he was a Penguin too. He was still young. He had been a Ranger. And he came to Pittsburgh. And I, I always liked him. You know, he's a typical Swede. The Swedes are really good defensive players. Right from the time uh, they get to the National Hockey League, they know how to play defense because they're taught that at a young age in Sweden. Very systematic hockey. So you could always rely on the Swedes to be good defensively. And uh, Samuelson was a good hockey player. So it is kind of weird to say that he screwed up there because that's really not him. I mean, he was a pretty reliable player uh, in terms of his defensive play. Well, him and Nick Lidstrom, I mean, you rarely see yeah. <laughs> Nick Lidstrom make a misread like that. And that had to be deflating, too, for, I guess, the the Detroit forwards on the bench because it just seemed like they couldn't buy a goal in that game. So they truly had no room for error. And, and to have a mistake like that where, well, a couple of mistakes that just results in the puck going in the back of their net just had to be, especially for guys like Zetterberg and Datsuk that were truly doing everything they could to get a goal and just couldn't make it happen they just had to be like man like that's that's got to be deflating it and like you guys talked about at the beginning with Fleury making that save in the first period I mean I think confidence a lot of times stems from the net out and you know a lot of times if you know your goalie is not having a good game even though you don't necessarily blame them it's still for anyone that's played the game knows when your goalie is having a rough game it's just like man like I can do anything and everything within my power but if my goalie is not going to make the saves then it doesn't what what can I do you know it doesn't necessarily matter so I think you know, that had to be a real deflating moment there for the Red Wings. Even though they did, a few minutes later, get another goal, it still just didn't feel like they were going to be able to get enough goals to win the game. We talked a lot about the 38-year-old Billy Guerin, 37-year-old at the time. I think he's 48 now. Chris Draper uh, gets in the, in the score sheet. First goal of the playoffs, picked a heck of a time for it to get the Red Wings back in this game. As you mentioned, Michelle, that was less than three minutes after Tyler Kennedy had put the score in uh, Pittsburgh's favor at 2 nothing, So Mike Babcock kind of with a, I, I want to say almost a Mike Sullivan line of thinking, going with some energy deeper in his lineup, and it pays off uh, with the goal from Draper. And all of a sudden, and you have a minute, what, minute 15 later, minute 18 later, of Kenny Malkin's in the box, and now all of a sudden it's a little bit dicier of a situation. Yeah, and especially too, can we talk about Mark Andre Fleury misplaying that puck behind the net right after? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, chain him to the post. <laughs> oh, I actually remember talking to Pascal Dupuis uh, about just Flower playing the puck. I don't know, like a couple of years later, and he said that you know it was something that every time Flower left the net, the guys like on the bench on the ice would be like, "Flower, get back in, get back in, Flower!" Like they hated him to the post. Yeah, they hated to see it as much as everybody did. And the fact too, that Flurry lost his stick and then had to, you know, scramble back and, and get into the net and, and stop a, you know, grade A scoring chance there. I mean, that was definitely something where I'm sure everybody at Mellon Arena watching, yeah, their heart rates had to just go through the roof on that one. Yeah, I said earlier that, you know, the 18th shot, they, that, that goal by Draper was the 18th shot for Detroit. They had had 19 in the first period of game four. And then they have that scramble around the net. So they have momentum right away from that goal. They had the momentum. The Penguins were on their heels for a moment. And again, that, that, the Penguins dodged a bullet there. Like, you know, you just, they just were getting the bounces and, and things were going their way when it looked like, you know, catastrophe was about to strike. It was really good that, the, and then 
Josh said, Malkin takes the cross check at 1818. Uh, it's the first power play of the game for Detroit. <laughs> so good, that 18, 18 of the third. So they're not calling anything on the Penguins. I don't know if the Penguins got away with anything, but I do know that the Red Wings probably thought they probably should have had a power play a little bit earlier than the eight, 18 mark of the third period. Well, it was earlier than that because it was about halfway through. Yeah, it was about uh, 9 18. 9 18. So, like, just prior to the midway point. And damn it. That was our first glimpse at Rob Scuderi. Let's say you want to talk about the piece. There's the preamble to the piece. <laughs> Go uh, for the it. shot squeezed through flurry. You've got a puck loose in the crease with no goaltender there. And not only Lidstrom, but Hoodler, both of them were darting right to that puck. And Rob Scuderi steps right in, swooshes it into the corner, gets it out of the way of danger. And that was the preamble to the piece. He made that was like he made three big key stops. <laughs> In that, in that game as a goaltender, quote-unquote. I, I know that one, he's just kind of batting the puck away. But really, that was, that was kind of a, a foreshadowing of things to come because I know we'll, we'll talk about the play later, but that was a huge point, too. And another lucky uh, bounce for Flurry because he kicked the puck with his left leg behind him. He kicked it out to the side so that Scuderi could clear it. Uh, if he kicks it back this way, it goes in the net. So, I mean, it was the totally lucky bounce, really, for Flower. I don't know I'm sure if he knew where the puck was. He turned and his... Left skate kicked it over to his right. And they killed two. The D, they the, killed the, the, Penguins D. the Penguins D were really good at, at uh, around the net and the forwards too. You know, we talked about it earlier in our one of the earlier podcasts, but I thought the Penguins really learned uh, how to protect the house. And they realized that every guy's job at that point is to try to keep the puck out of the net. It's not just the goaltender. So the Penguins had back-to-back -back penalty kills there. And, I mean, is there anything that gets the crowd going more than a good penalty kill or two? I mean, I think that's one of the most interesting things I've learned since working in sports and watching games every night from the press box is that it, maybe even more so sometimes than a big goal or a big hit is a big penalty kill. And, and so the fans were really behind uh, the Penguins in that one. That was huge for the Penguins, too, especially after letting in three power play goals in the previous game for them to bounce back with back-to-back uh, penalty kills there. I think that was absolutely huge for them uh, going into the final minutes of this period. You're so right about that. I love, I love, I love when when you kill a big penalty and the fans are hanging on every clear and uh, and, and hanging on every save that the goalie makes, and they can feel the pressure. But there's a they're they're like the excitement of the fans actually helps seems to help your team kill the penalty. It's like us against the world right now, and we're <laughs> going to kill the penalty. And then when you do, it's this awesome feeling of exhilaration. That you've weathered the storm it's a great feeling and you can gain a lot of momentum from that for sure and uh and it takes something out of the opposition you know the other team when they don't score on the power play it deflate it's deflating so those were those were big kills for the penguins for sure with the red wings right there knocking on the door to tie the game i mean you talk about pressure and uh being able to, to withstand that on your home ice you know, when you're facing elimination a lot, that's a character building situation for sure. Talk about the defense and how good they were. Going through Brooks Orpik's mind, and his dump is blocked down by Datsuk, and then he's helplessly chasing Dan Cleary with a buck 45 left on a breakaway. <laughs> <laughs> just the helplessness there. You, you got to be feeling for him, just the pit in his stomach. And then we talked about Flurry all day, all night. Came up with a big save. You know, he tracked it well. Cleary tried to go backhand, forehand. Flurry stayed right with him, slid right over the pad, took everything away, took away the angle, played it perfectly. I mean, you can't play it better as a goaltender from the technique standpoint than on that breakaway than Flurry did. So Edzo said that he thought Cleary should have gone five hole. Was there actually room there for him to go five hole? She disagree. I, the only reason he opened up the five holes is because Cleary pulled the puck aside. Flurry had his stick down, and maybe when he pulled it, he could have went back against the grain. But I think Flurry would have made the save either way because he kept his stick down as the butterfly goaltender. You know, one of the things that occurred to me in our last podcast when we were singing the praises of Helm and Cleary is that I guess if you had guys who were creating more scoring chances uh, for their team, you'd want them because they really, neither one of them is a great goal scorer, right? So, <laughs> they, they, so they both end up with these awesome opportunities, but they can't finish, you know? I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting sure to bad memories, Michelle. Yes, I'm oh, sure. <laughs> Because Cleary had another chance early in the game that he couldn't score on. Like, man, like you think back on these missed chances, it's like you need to have guys that can finish. Like, you know, like how 
you, you talked about Brian Russ, like that he can finish. Like you need to have those guys that know how to put the puck in the back of the net and clutch situations and get those clutch goals. And the Red Wings were not getting them from, from guys like Cleary in this game. And they needed them badly because, you know, you don't, you don't win in the, you don't win a cup without that. Your role players have to be the best role players and the Penguins role players were the best role players in this series. No question about it. No question. Uh, Tyler Kennedy, a good example, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, when you have a third line right winger like Tyler Kennedy scoring big goals for you, and then you have these guys on the other side not scoring when they're getting opportunities, uh, that's usually uh, when you win and, and the other team doesn't, because <laughs> that's exactly what happened. When you talk about role players, and we mentioned the, the goal scoring aspect of role players, about the piece himself. Sam, you alluded to it earlier, Rob Scuderi. Uh, what, 14 seconds left in this game. I just want to say as an aside really quickly, I don't know why in every sport, in every critical moment when there's a scramble or a sequence where something could happen, there's this high-pitched scream from someone in the crowd. <laughs> it happens in any broadcast of any sport, in any major moment, especially in hockey. It pisses me off. I just want to get that out there. Uh, <laughs> second of all, <laughs> great saves by Rob Scenario with the like. I just had to get that out in the open. I'm sorry. I've been, I've been cooped up in a house for three weeks. I had to say it to somebody. <laughs> I love it. Now Josh is the one that's triggered. <laughs> yeah, triggered yeah. I just don't like that noise. I, I get triggered by I get triggered by the uh, microphones mounted on the glass and you hear it. You hear people pounding on the glass all the time. It's like the loudest thing on the telecast. Some moron pounding the glass in the microphone, picking it up and coming through loudly on your television, which is just driving me crazy as a broadcaster. I thought it was a height <laughs> of stupidity to do that, to have those mics picking that up of all the things. Uh, and, and every now and then they do pick up those, <laughs> somebody screaming like, uh, you know, right next to that mic. Well, I think they had a, a right to scream at that point. That was probably <laughs> the, the biggest moment of the entire series. And, and I, I think the smarts of Rob Scuderi, too, not to just – I mean, he had good butterfly technique. He was down. His legs were tight. His skates <laughs> down on the ice, t you know, taking away the bottom. And that's exactly where Franz, who obviously couldn't get off a great shot because he's falling down and just kind of desperately whacking at this loose puck that is in the crease. But uh, fun, two, two funny things I'll bring up was that uh, Scuderi not only made, like, one save. He made, I think, three saves. Yeah, three. Uh, one with his stick, one with his knee, one with his skate. And on top of that, actually looking at the replay when they showed the overhead – um, Flurry actually reached back and had his blocker and arm down. So I almost think if Scuderi's not there, it goes and hits Flurry in his arm, and then we're singing the praise of Mark Andre Flurry making this ridiculous save with his own blocker and arm. But then again, maybe it skirts under and goes in. So you know, who knows what we'll say? But I'll say just the smart heads up play by Scuderi, not only to be there and to make the move, but to, to use the right technique as a goaltender. I mean, I don't know if he's ever had any goaltending training in his career or in his life, but he certainly would put it on display there in those final final 15 seconds. Well, Sam, for fans that are listening that might not know or, you know, have any idea, what is the story behind the piece? Well, Rebsky, well, so they were they got together as a team. And they were talking about everybody has to fill the role. Everyone has to play a part in it. And so Rob Scuderi stood up on his part, and he was supposed to say, I am a piece in this whole puzzle below. But instead, he misspoke and said, I am the piece to this whole puzzle. So then the players started kind of jokingly calling him, oh, the piece, he's the piece. He's, he's the reason we're winning. He's the reason we're doing all this. So he kind of latched on to his misspeak when he's trying to say, I'm a piece. He accidentally said, I am the piece. So it was just a, it was just a playful little banter that uh, the team hit him with. And then lo and behold, he ends up being the piece in game six as, the, as time's running out. So yeah, he lived up to the, uh, the funny nickname that was uh, bestowed upon him. Did you see... Uh... Before that happened, Hosa turned the puck over at the Penguins blue line, and the Penguins Kunitz and Sid came back on a two-on-one. And Osgood made a really good save there. Um, so the Penguins could have had this game locked up uh, because of Hosa turning the puck over, which is not right, something that, that Hosa. But Hosa was a disappointment, I would say. What would you say, Michelle? I, I would because you know I know how, how what a great player he is, and I don't feel like. He could have picked up the slack for Datsuk if he had played at a higher level. He, he just, he didn't do it. Yeah, that's, I think that's the frustrating part is like they, they needed Hosa to step up and be more of a factor, especially with, yeah, Datsuk being out and he wasn't. I mean, he was barely noticeable, if noticeable at all during this entire uh, final series. So I think, you know, that's, 
was definitely a tough pill to swallow is that, you know, he was supposed to add on to this already, you know, incredible team full of veteran leaders that had won the, you know, won the cup in, in 08. And yeah, he, uh, he was only, he's supposed to add to it, but he definitely uh, didn't bring a whole lot to the table that year. Fortunate for, uh, for, for the Red Wings and very fortunate for the Penguins, because of course he said he wanted to go to Detroit because they had a better chance to win the cup. And here the Penguins playing in their final home game of the year. Uh, no matter what, the fans are absolutely delirious at the Civic Arena with the Penguins holding on for dear life to win this game and uh, with an opportunity to, to win the Stanley Cup. It was, it was really special. And, you know, I don't know if people thought that they were saying goodbye to the Penguins in a sense of that year, but that was the last home game. And the next time they would see them would be, well, on the streets of uh, the city of Pittsburgh. But there was one more game to play between that celebration everything that came with it the first ever game seven of a stanley cup final for the penguins at least as they went to detroit and joe lewis arena on june 12 2009 that's going to be our final episode of this five-part mini series we look back on the 2009 final looking forward to talking with you guys then thanks as always for tuning in we hope everyone out there stays safe stays healthy for michelle crecciolo sam Cassan, and paul staggerwald i'm josh getzoff we appreciate you tuning in to the scoop podcast rewind presented by PPG.